We're going to be looking this week at lecturing and how do we go through the, the notebook with a group of people. And a group of people can be two people, it could actually be one person, it could be a Sunday school class, or you could be lecturing to a, to a broader group. But we want to go through the diagrams and begin to see the flow of what we're trying to do and what we want to accomplish in a person's life. You could give me a map right now and put on the map a dot where the airport is and I can't get to the airport. Why? I don't know where I'm at. So you got to put a dot on the map of where I'm at and if you put one where I'm at then I know where I'm going to go. Now we'll stick with this one simple teaching and, and we'll build around it and we'll build and we'll build and we'll build but there's nothing the nearness of Christ won't fix in your life. Truth isn't preached, it's demonstrated. So I have Christ on this hand and problems on this hand and when Christ is my focus, the problems are there, but they don't overwhelm me. Amen? And when my problems are my focus, then I'm overwhelmed. So one of the things we want to do with people and we want to do in lectures is let them understand where they're at, to put a dot on the map, to understand what the problems are, why they're there, what the obstacles are, but then to always be driving for the goal, and the goal is an awareness of Christ, a recognition of Christ, a focus on Christ because there's nothing His nearness doesn't fix in my life. So we'll be going through the diagrams, each one of them, and I'll look at the goal of the diagram and then how do we get to the diagram. Now, I don't want you to have a panic attack. If you can understand the material at a 5% level at the end of the week, that's all you need to know because the rest of your life you'll build on it. And so if you get the basic idea, you'll be able to add yourself because the best material is yet to be written. You're the one that can write it. And it has to come through your uniqueness. So if you learn everything exactly the way I learn it, you've killed your own uniqueness and creativity. We're not trying to do that. We're trying to get a general idea of what we're communicating and then you communicate it out of your own uniqueness. And we'll encourage you to change things and do things. And so we're not stressed about getting everything right and exactly right. If you've pointed someone to Christ, you've done more than 99% of people will ever do in their lives. And so the thing I like about this ministry is there's no way to fail. You just can't fail. And you'll talk and, and things will fall out of your mouth and they don't sound right and they don't fit and all this. But if you tried to point someone to Christ, you did better than anyone else. And so I want to encourage you in that. You don't have to know all the material. We want to know it at a 5% level. And then you'll begin to build on that in your life and be able to share that with uh, other people. Now, we'll go through it and it'll seem overwhelming as we do it. So what we'll do is we'll do a section. Say we'll do a section on faith. We'll look at the diagrams on faith. We'll look at the goal of each diagram and how that diagram fits into the whole. And then we'll come back and we'll do another diagram and when you go back this time, you have to go through both of those. Then we'll do a third one, and you do all three. And you'll see that you can go through those very, very quickly. So I want to encourage you, don't be overwhelmed in any, uh, in, uh, in any of this, because we'll be able to move right along in it, and you'll see we'll be here to answer all your questions. This week we're going to do uh, lecturing, and then next week we're going to do counseling. And you'll see how you tie this together, but you'll have a good grasp of the diagrams. Now I think we have about 120 diagrams in the notebook and we're going to try to cover most of those. There's another 120 diagrams on top of that that we're not going to be covering because those are diagrams that help make the other diagrams clear and there's just material that we've added over the years. So what I'll do is uh, I'll have a couple of evenings where anybody that wants to can come in here, you can ask questions, I'll show you some more diagrams, show you how it clarifies different things and you can ask me. But it's really uh, the most important thing is just to get the core down and, and get the concept down and see where we're taking a person. How do you take up the cross and deny yourself if you don't know what self is? And so what we want to do is explain what self is to give definition to terms and to look at the blockages that people have and making Christ their focus. We're always going to this very, very simple truth. I can understand the atheist, the agnostic, the person who's anti-Christian on this one level. They come to you and they say this, we don't quite get it. God made man. He made him in a way that he couldn't keep the commandments that he gave the man. And now he judges the man 
and sends the man to hell. Then he says that he offers salvation and forgiveness through Jesus Christ because he loves you so much, but if you don't believe in him, he's going to send you to hell now. Do you see where the guy's confused? God makes you in a way that you can't keep the commandments. And then He judges you for not keeping them. Then He gives you a Savior. But if you don't believe in the Savior, you're going to hell also. And that is basically what we hear when it comes to a doctrine or theology of God. And everything's built around that. I just want to throw something else out and look at this a little differently. And I'm only asking you to listen to it. And I'm not even saying that it's right. And you've heard me say this over and over again. If you're right in everything you say, you're wrong in everything you say because you're wrong in your attitude. And your attitude makes you wrong. I know that everything I say isn't right. And I know that I say strange things. And I ask people to let the Spirit lead them, to test it by the Spirit, and to receive what God's given to them and cast out what He isn't giving to them. It was interesting when I was in Brazil speaking to a group of pastors. And I said to the pastors, was Jesus ever sick? And they said, no. And I said, but he said I was sick. And you visited me. And they go, yeah, but he didn't really mean that. <laughs> I said, well, what did he mean then? He said, I was sick and you visited me. What did he mean then? And they go, well, he didn't mean that. And I said, it's really odd, brothers, that Jesus could be abused, rejected, neglected, a, a crown of thorns beat into his head, beat, speared, crucified, but he never had a migraine headache. <laughs> and anyway, sin and sickness tracked together often, and he had the sins of the whole world cast upon him. How could it be that he was never sick? That he never entered into my humanity? Because he had the sins of the world cast on him. Does he know what it's like to be sick? Well, I could see this wasn't going anywhere. And they'd trenched in because it was health, wealth, and prosperity, and Jesus came so you'd feel better. <laughs> so I knew this wasn't going to go anywhere. And I stopped and I said, Brothers, have you ever heard of Thanksgiving in the U.S.? They go, Yeah. I said, Thanksgiving dinner. They said, Yeah, we've heard it's your biggest dinner. I said, You don't know how big it is. It's huge. There is so much food there. But I said, do you know what makes the Thanksgiving dinner the very best and the whole weekend the best? It's if the next day you can use the toilet. Because <laughs> you eat that much food and get constipated and all of a sudden it doesn't look that good. And what your body does is takes what's best out of you and expels what isn't the best. So I said, here's what we're going to do. Take a break and go to the spiritual toilet and get rid of whatever Mike said that wasn't the best. Now I know everything I say isn't right. I know everything that I say isn't the best. But I know this thing is the best and this thing is right. And this is my goal. And in my life this is my one uh, passion. And that is to make Christ the focus. That is true. And so I may not do it properly. I may not get it right. But I'd like you to think of man in a different way. And the plan of God in a little bit different way that one day the son said to the father, I want a bride. I would like to have a bride. And it happened eons and eons ago. I want a bride. And if you're going to have a bride then, the bride's going to have to be in your own image. And so he created man to ultimately become the bride of Christ. Now, Jesus says he's the vine. He's not like the vine. He is the vine. Every vine preaches and teaches Christ. And he holds all things together. He's the divine glue. There's nothing that exists outside of him. It's an interesting thing that when Jesus put mud in the man's eyes and he washed his eyes, the first thing the blind man saw were people as though they were trees. Do you know what blind people see from birth? What a person born blind sees, they see nothing. It's like trying to see out the end of your finger. They don't see anything. And so Jesus helps this man in that he does understand a tree. He has tasted them. He's touched them. He's smelled them. He knows trees. And Jesus lets him see men as trees. And he looks around. He sees the men as trees. But if he looked at Jesus, what he would see there is a vine. 
I am the vine. And in Colossians 1, we know this, that he holds all things together, and things only exist because he holds them together. So he's holding every person together. He's the vine, and every one of you were created a branch on that vine. Now here's a distinctive thing. It's not right to tell people that they're cut off from God, because if you're cut off from God, you can't exist. That's impossible. So you're born connected to Him, and the purpose of life is not to work your way into God, but the purpose of life is to recognize the one that you're attached to. I'm not saying that everyone's going to heaven. I'm not saying everyone's going to heaven. I'm not saying everyone's going to heaven. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> Everyone isn't going to heaven. But what I am saying is this. Every single person on the face of the planet Earth is living on Jesus, but Jesus isn't living in every person. And in John 15, when he says, Every branch in me that bears fruit, he prunes. Those that don't, he cuts away and ultimately he throws them into the fire. He isn't talking about believers that didn't bear fruit. He's talking about the unbelievers that spent their whole lives attached to him and refused to ever recognize him. Think of it for a minute. Test it. It's impossible for man to go find God. You would never find him. And Paul in his great sermon makes it very clear. That God who you call the unknown God is the only God. And it's in God that we move and we breathe and we have our being. And you're not recognizing him. And so man refuses to recognize. It's really true when they say this, that children don't have to be taught to love Jesus. They have to be taught to not love him. And that's why we look at Romans and we understand then why people who haven't heard the gospel yet have looked around and seen Christ in the created things and seen him in the things uh, that he holds together and they've lived to it and they've never completely closed the door to him. And that's why babies go to heaven because they haven't closed the door to him. And there's also people who close the door. If I spend 70 years tied to your arm attached to you, I go with you everywhere, and then at the end of the 70 years you say, I don't believe in Mike. What's there to do to help you? I can't help you at all. The purpose of this life is not to create something, but to recognize something. In the garden, Adam and Eve wanted to know. But here's the secret. God's goal for you is to not know. Because when you know everything, you don't have faith. And we're constantly striving to know, but his goal is to not know. I'm in the will of God because I don't know anything. And then we're constantly being in the image of God, wanting to create something. But he's the one that has done it all. It all ends at him. And spiritual growth, Christian growth, is not a series of you creating holiness. It's a series of you recognizing holiness. It's not a series of you creating your own victory. It's a series of you recognizing the victory that you've always had. Everything is given to me. I have everything pertaining to life and godliness in Christ Jesus. Is that true or not true? But I don't recognize it. And the beautiful thing about our God, who is the only God, as the Hindus ask me, what God do you worship? And I said, the God of the Hindus. And they said, which one? I said, the only one the Hindus have, Jesus. He's the only God. There isn't any other God. They're all fantasies. And he actually put you on this vine in the place that would give you the best opportunity to recognize him. Have you ever wondered why you weren't born in Africa and you were born here? Why were you born, why were you born in, in Spain? Why? Why? Because if you had had a better opportunity to know him there, you would have been born there. And the beautiful thing about him is, since he holds all thing to, things together, when this branch suffers and he's holding it together, who else suffers? He does. He's in the midst of human suffering. He doesn't stand outside of it. And the goal in this life is for me to say, I see you. I recognize you. I am attached to you. You are my life. You have given me everything pertaining to life. And it's progressive, and as his life begins to flow in me, because through choice, and we're going to be very, very heavy on choice, and Ray and I do not teach free will, the doctrine of free will, and we do not teach the doctrine of sovereignty. There's no salvation in free will. There's no salvation in sovereignty. There's only salvation in Jesus Christ. And choice is different than either one of those things. 
It's one of the things that keeps me in the image of God is that I have the ability to choose. And as I go through life, I begin to choose. Now, what will make me choose? I need to recognize. I want to recognize. He wants me to recognize. He stays vitally attached to me until the end of my days. And if you look up in a tree, you don't know why, but all of a sudden, a branch is dead and you cut it out and you burn it. Why is it dead? I don't know. It just stopped recognizing the vine. It never did recognize it. It ended. He wants me to recognize him and he wants a bride and he wants a bride in his image and a bride that comes by choice. So how does he do all that? Here's Adam and Eve standing in the garden. And Adam and Eve have yet to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So they're standing there. And then here's the Christian couple. They're standing there. So here's Mike and Betty in the garden. And we happen to be standing next to Adam and Eve. And they haven't eaten from the fruit yet. Who's better? Well, well, what do we hear? What do we hear? Who, who's better? What are we all striving for? To the pre-fall. I want to get back to the garden. If only they hadn't have done that in the garden. All the bad choices in the garden. If I could just get back to the garden somehow. And now... This teaching comes across, and it may not be overt, but it's definitely covert, that you've now accepted Christ and He's taking you back to the place where Adam was, and now work yourself to death to maintain it so you don't mess up. <laughs> and so we're told to do that. Which couple's better? Well, the couple that's better is the Christian couple. They're better than Adam and Eve before they sinned. Why? If Adam and Eve never fail, they're going to spend all of eternity on the earth because flesh and blood does not enter the kingdom of God and they'll never go. They'll spend all of eternity on the earth. But because I have Christ in me, I have an eternal life and I go to heaven to be the very bride of God. Here's my question then. Was God counting on the fall of man? Was it his ultimate plan that they stay in the garden forever when he wanted a bride? They could never be the bride on, on, in the garden. So it was never his ultimate plan that that was perfection and that Adam and Eve in the garden are plan A and Jesus was plan B. God needed the fall. I'm not saying he created it. We created it. We did it through choice. But he knew what we would choose, didn't he? And, he? and he needed that. Because there's something I've got to do, and that's go from being Adam and Eve, perfect in the garden, to Mike and Betty with the very life of Christ in him, to share in all the things of Christ, and to go to heaven and actually marry God. How's he going to take me from here over to here? Well, there's a little room that I'm going to have to enter into. Because I need to turn my heart to Him. And Adam and Eve didn't have their hearts turned toward God. Now here's the thing I believe in being created in the image of God. And I'm like God, but I'm not God. God is the I Am, and we say He's the I Am with the big I. And so we're made in His image, and we can see a little bit of God, vaguely, in a mirror. But when you look at the three parts of man and the three parts of God, here's the, very, the Father, we have the Son, and the Father expresses Himself through the Son, and the Son expresses Himself through the Holy Spirit, so you have those three. But really what makes God is God is His heart. It's the source of God. In Hebrew, the name I am means the source of the source. Scholars agree on this thing that I am is not the name of God, it's a descriptor. It's what God is. He is the I am. He is the source. There's nothing outside that source. And the amazing thing about God is, is that there's a source to the 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 source, which is eternal. You can never get to the end of God. You never know who He is completely and totally. But I'm made in His image, and I'm an I am with a small I. 
And so I have a body and a soul and a spirit, but I also have a heart. There's a source to my being. And if the heart isn't converted, the spirit can't be converted. And if the spirit's not converted, the soul can't be converted. So everything has to begin in the heart. I have a heart. Now here's the problem. I'm made in the image of God. I have a heart. But my heart source stops there when the source of my heart needs a source. I've got to have a source to my heart. And so I think I'm God, but I'm not God. Because I need a source to my source, a source to my heart. And He has to be the source of my heart. Now, God, in order for you to be in His image, He must give you the desire of your heart. Because the heart is what makes you in the image of God. And when you don't get the desire of your heart freely and you can't choose the desire of your heart, you're no longer in His image. And that explains why evil people get the evil they want. Why good people get the good they want. And why if you want Christ, you can have all of Him you want. He will give you the desire of your hearts. You know, I made this mistake for years in believing that people were in the midst of a great struggle. And so you're talking to the alcoholic and they're in the midst of this great struggle with alcohol and they hate alcohol so bad. And you're talking to the person that slanders, oh, and they just hate slander so bad. And you're talking to the person that hates their husband and they just hate it so bad and they're just struggling and struggling and struggling and look at my great struggle. Do you know it took me a long time to realize they were all getting the desire of their heart? Oh yeah, I hate my wife, but there's something I hate worse, to love her. I'm getting the desire of my heart. God must give you the desire of your heart for you to remain in His image. Oh, well, I hate, I hate that I was abused. I totally hate that I was abused. I know, but I know something you hate worse than being abused, and that would be to forget what was behind you and press on to the high call of Christ Jesus. See, we like to say we're struggling in our hearts because it makes my heart sound better than deceitful and wicked. And it makes my flesh sound a whole lot better because I'm struggling. But I'm not struggling. I'm getting the desire of my heart. And one day when my heart bows, it converts and it says, God, you're the source. You come and be the source now. I'm looking to you. And my life then, once I bow the heart and the heart is converted, there's conversion that's progressive throughout my whole being as my heart works its way through, through me and brings these minor conversions where all of a sudden I bow my knee. I was really interested in seeing this. Um, he was a famous um, rock star in the 60s, a uh, black fellow. He'd been a Christian back then. Well, anyway, the other day, he, he, he was a heroin addict, became a heroin addict. He's on the street, he's homeless, he's a heroin addict. He's getting the desire of his heart. He's going to heaven, but he's living in hell. He's believed in Christ, and he says he's struggling with heroin. And he's been struggling for 20 years. But he's really getting the desire of his heart. Because Christ has set you free. It's an interesting study if you go through the Bible and just study all things. Just the phrase, all things. And he has set me free, Romans says, from all things. And it says that all things have been given to Christ. So Christ can do all things. And he said that he's sitting on the park bench and someone came and started talking to him about Jesus. And he said at that moment when he was listening, the desire of his heart was to be free from drugs. And in an instant he said, I was free because God gave the desire of his heart. When it's my desire, he gives it. Now we're confused when we believe that the way we get the desire of our heart is determine what the desire ought to be and then start changing my behavior to prove it. That's not what I'm teaching. I'm saying when it is the desire of your heart, he will give it to you. And he's bringing me to a place where the desires of my heart are actually starting to bend toward him. What does he use to get me to the place where my heart will bow the knee and say, I want you in that area of my life. I want you. And he keeps putting me in those places. 
What would God need? What kind of environment would accomplish that the very best? Well, he would say, yes. Because there's things that I can learn in suffering that I could never learn in comfort. And so there's a room that Adam and Eve and their perfection must enter into. And in this room, they'll find the source to their source, hopefully, which is Christ. And in this room, they'll begin to bow their knee and they'll make choices and conversion will begin to happen. Do you know that this means that eons before God ever made man, he made the devil and he made him for a reason. You can think what you think about Africans and ignorant people and people that can't read, but my experience has been that people can hear God. They can be taught by the Holy Spirit. They can have his anointing. And this one ignorant man in Africa tells me this. He says, oh, I saw the battle in heaven with Satan and the angels. I saw it one day in a vision. I said, you saw it? Of course I saw it. I said, well, what was it like? He said, it wasn't much of a battle. <laughs> because here was, here was Lucifer and he had all of his angels behind him. And there was the archangel Michael and they had all their angels behind. And he said, when they ran together and they collided, instantly Satan was subdued. And he said, I couldn't even see it. It happened so fast that when he met Michael, he was on the ground. And Michael had his, had his foot on his neck and he had a sword to his head. And he said, it happened that fast. And he said, and then God spoke to Michael, releasing. And he said, Michael released him and bowed the knee and never looked up. And then God went and spoke to him and said, I have a plan for him in man. Let him go. See, I believe that. That he had a plan in all of this, eons before man was ever made. As soon as the son said, I want a bride. And so to go from being Adam and Eve that would live in this, and, and, and mind you this, the Bible doesn't say they were perfect, it says they were good. The Bible says you're perfect. It didn't say they were perfect. They were in transition. They were good. God made it and it was good. We're not arguing that it was good. But it wasn't perfect. Perfect is Christ in you. And so now they move into this room and in this room, God has permitted exactly what is needed for the conversion of the heart, for me to acknowledge that I'm like Him but I'm not Him, and to prepare me to be the kind of person that could be married to God. There's a devil. There's a fall. You have to have flesh because you cannot be taught without contrast. I would challenge you to give any teaching with words that have no anonyms. And you can't teach. You cannot teach without contrast. There has to be contrast. Every significant thing that you've learned in your life, you learned in contrast. And so there's nothing that you've learned that didn't come in a contrast. God needs a contract. How do you teach about God if there's not a devil? How can there be a hell if there's not a heaven? How can there be peace if there's not war? You have to have contrast. You don't know anything. If your life was just constant successes, constant joys, and never any struggles, you would have committed suicide. You have to learn through contrast. It's absolutely impossible. I need this flesh to learn of Him. Hannah and I were talking about it last night. Don't be discouraged when your flesh comes up because the flesh comes up before a revelation of Christ comes. Because how do you learn without a contrast in that? You would need bad health and sin and wars and death and conflicts and you'd need religion, the clubs of the half converted. Because it's not church, it's the club of the half converted. <laughs> There's the tennis club, the hockey club, everybody's got to have a club, the swim club, well amen, the Christians ought to have a club too, they can have their club. But it's just a club, this is church where two or more are gathered together and he's in their midst. That's church. Those are clubs. I like clubs. I like using the, uh, going to clubs. It's fine to have a club. But you know what? A club will wear you out because the president has all the rules. He doesn't keep them, but you have to. Religion will wear you out. And we'll talk about, uh, about how, just how much religion does wear you out. So we got all the clubs. You need to be lonely and poverty, sickness. You need all the lists to keep. And do you know what? He knew that in this room, 
as he brought you to the knee and you bowed and you said, I need a source of my source, that the process that would bring you to bowing the knee would produce sin. And the father says, what about that? And Jesus said, I told you I want a bride. I'll wear it. I'll take it. I'll take the sins of the whole world because I know people will not bow their knee without sin and I've got to carry it and I'll carry it because I want my bride. And so he then takes the sins of the whole world. And when we get done, he's produced someone that is choosing him because of contrast, because of the world. 